All right, now we have the fun opportunity of having a little three-way conversation here. We get to catch up with our new editor-in-chief, Dan Roberts, as well as our reporter, Colin Salau. We're going to be talking about some of the Team USA drama that was on the horizon this weekend and how that's kind of built up over time. So, Colin, can you kind of get us up to speed on this whole situation with Jalen Brown, Team USA, Grant Hill, everything that's going on here? It's kind of been unfolding for a number of weeks now. Um, but it seems to really have come to a head this weekend. So kind of take us through the the facts of what's going on in this situation. Yeah, so two weeks ago, or I think almost three weeks ago now, uh, Jalen Brown was not chosen to replace Kawhi Leonard on Team USA. Instead, they gave it to his teammate, Derek White. And then Jalen Brown went on social media, started to do some of those cryptic tweets but he had one specific tweet that wasn't so cryptic. It was tagging Nike and asking them, hey, what's going on? So he has this, um, he, he he was asked in a press uh, by some reporters at Summer League. And he said, yeah, he thinks that Nike has some sort of involvement into why he didn't make Team USA. Now, Grant Hill, speaking this weekend, um, explains to the dad, on the Dan Patrick show that um, you know, it wasn't because of, of any conspiracy theory. That's what he says. It was because of balance in the team. You know, Derek White is more of a role player in a team full of superstars. And they wanted someone who could be a guard defender. Um, and then Jalen Brown responded once again on social media on X um, by saying, hey, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Um, I've been, you know, I'm a, I, I've been in the... Uh, a vice president of the NB- NBPA for, for years now. Um, and so now it's, you know, it, it's, we have the team trying to win gold, but there's this thing on the side between a guy who's not on the team, but is the finals MVP in the NBA and the president of USA Basketball. Guys, I mean, to jump in on this, as if we needed any more drama involving this year's Celtic squad, Right. And uh, John, here's where you and I should divulge our allegiances that we're both Celtics fans. Um, I'm I'm big on everyone just uh, disclosing their biases. We all have them. Everyone's got a team. I think it'd be silly if we pretended we didn't. So I'm a Boston guy. I'm a Celtics fan. And when we won the finals, Banner 18, what up? Uh, I saw so many takes from people being like, boring, boring. And I get it. I, I do. I think there's a lot of people that think that between Tatum and Jalen, they're not the two most charismatic stars in the league. Um, you know, set that aside for a minute. But here now we have yet another story involving Jalen. And by the way, if we want to bring in the fact that as we record this, we just had the first game and they didn't play Tatum. And Steve Kerr had to respond and address that. And this was after Jalen, surprising to some, took the finals MVP trophy, not Jason Tatum. So, and I'm willing to believe and take them at their word that there's no drama between them, that there's nothing there, but boy, it comes to Jalen and Tatum and their stature and how they're respected or in their eyes, maybe not respected by everyone. Uh, and then you bring in Nike. There's a lot here. Yeah. You have all these superstars on Team USA. They're having a great time. And then you have Jalen kind of looking in from the outside and we know historically in his career, he's been someone who's like not afraid to ruffle feathers and put his reputation on the line for what he thinks is right. So like, Colin, when you're looking at the situation, right, obviously there's this conspiracy idea that there's some political machine working behind the scenes of Team USA. But what do you think is the significance from Jalen Brown's personal brand, whether that fact is true or not, what do you think of him kind of taking on this massive machine, taking on Nike, taking on Team USA and just saying, hey, I'm willing to put myself out there, willing to put my reputation on the line a little bit here. Yeah, I think to your point, he's he's becoming, he's. I think he's the developing, like what LeBron James did, which is give players player empowerment. That was his legacy in the NBA. It was to say, hey, you guys can do whatever you want because now you can be more influential in your own brand. I think this is kind of Jalen Brown taking that, you know, three steps further. We've seen other people do it. Now Brown's like, well, I I have this $300 million contract. I'm set with my money, but I also believe in certain things. Now, you know, you could say what you want about what he believes in and if you, you know, side with him, but he's empowered to do that. And I think, you know, 
we, we're seeing a lot of other players, but specifically with brand sponsorships, you know, the likes of Nikola Jokic are going with, you know, Chinese brands. Kyrie is going with a Chinese brand. So Jalen Brown has not signed a deal uh, for a sneaker since 2021 when he left Adidas. I think he's just, you know, telling him, t- saying, I believe in this. This is what I want. And this is how, where players are, especially in the NBA nowadays. We should say, I, I, I don't want to get it wrong and quote the exact stat, but I saw a tweet uh, after the finals that uh, Jalen was the first finals MVP without a signature shoe deal in some amount of years. Uh, so just as you said, Colin, I mean, this, this is notable. Now I get the impression he can have one if and when he wants it. I mean, maybe I'll be wrong about that, I, you know, but let's add to the mix. It's becoming a long list. How about uh, Stephen A. reading on air a text from an NBA source, this was during the playoff run, that people don't like Jalen because he has a big ego and that he's a locker room problem. And, of course, Jalen famously retweeted a shirt that Celtics players wore at the victory parade. Um, You know, I am not a full-time NBA reporter. I will say, though, that years ago when I was at Yahoo Finance, uh, we had Jalen Brown in for an interview. And it was when he was so young, I, mean, I think 2015, and he had just been named, or maybe 2016, he had just been named uh, to the NBA PA board or, or the, the second rep, VP, whatever that title is. And, you know, he didn't strike me as someone who remotely has an ego. Um, now, of course, it's been a few years and now he's become extremely good, but um, I'm willing to take his word for it. And I just, I love that, you know, tweet it out. I think Colin's right. LeBron laid a lot of groundwork for this. Remember, shut up and dribble. I mean, that one phrase, that one moment um, fueled athletes across multiple sports to speak their mind, not worry anymore about the PR machine and being told, "Mm, don't say that, delete that. State your source. I love it. Yeah, I think also, too, there's an aspect here of, right, like a a David versus Goliath situation, too, right? Like Jalen Brown's not going to back down. We saw him step up in the moment in the finals, you know, he was a, a, a leading scorer for the Celtics. I think he finished just under Tatum for the series average, right, for points per game. But he was he was being a force and asserting himself. And and you know we've heard we've heard a lot this you know this off season and with Team USA on the women's side too about Caitlin Clark's omission on the team and kind of like the forces that be here. And again, I don't want to speculate too much, right? But like there has to be some level of like this political vibe to Team USA where. You know, Tatum supports Brown, and then two days later, he doesn't play a minute, right? And, and you know, uh, Caitlin Clark, now Dawn, Dawn Staley, now saying that they kind of wish she was on the team to begin with, right? Like, there's someone or something it feels like in the organization that might be playing a role where it might just exceed the, hey, it's only basketball that Steve Kerr was trying to say at the beginning of this week. Yeah, I want to say, like, you know, conspiracy theories range, right? There are sure. some that are probably, you know, really wildly you know just just out of the spectrum but then i think there are some that have some form of reference point right there maybe it's not this maybe nike wasn't maybe jalen brown is speculating here and maybe he's just it is a conspiracy theory but i'm sure there's a there, there's a certain level of of p- politics that's involved in these things for example on the women's side we all we all respect diana tarasi she's the great if not the greatest women's basketball player one of the best but Ultimately, she hasn't been performing to that level, but she's there because of politics. She's there because she's a veteran, and that's completely fine for everybody. I, I nobody's complaining about Diana Taurasi being on the team, but that is some level of of not just basketball skill. That's the reason why you're there. So I think there's always some form of basis for these things that isn't just. Are you the best basketball player on the court? And it's and it's not only like like you were saying, like that's not a bad thing. Like we can respect that, you know, if she's there for that reason, if someone is not there because they're a rookie, that's something. But like be public about it, be forthcoming about it. I think it's, you know, the thing that that probably is frustrating for Jalen Brown looking in on the situation is, hey, why can't we just admit that like there's a little bit more going on behind the scenes than the X's and O's on a basketball court? And I think it's that that discrepancy that's maybe driving some of the frustration behind this. And by the way, I mean, look no further than one of my favorite examples, Udonis Haslam, uh, for the evidence that sometimes you do keep someone around, even if they're not one of the five leading scorers, because they are a player coach, they are good for morale, they are, you know, the core fabric of the team, they're part of the gang, all that makes sense to me. Uh, One last note I would make on the Caitlin Clark stuff too. I want to make sure we don't misquote, although I actually agree that, 
even though she didn't say the following, she probably also meant this. Don Staley didn't come outright and say, we wish Caitlin Clark was on, or even that we should have put her on, although I think that's also the case. What she said was, if we had to do it again now, she would make the team. And of course, that allows her to protect herself because it's like, well, yeah, factually, Caitlin Clark ironically started playing much better after they didn't put her on the Olympic team. But I think it's also probably true that do they wish she was on? I mean, it was it was a fun debate. You know, you don't make these decisions necessarily for ratings, but at the same time, you know, you want everyone, you want the fans to be interested in watching. And it's like, gee, even if you can defend the argument of not having her on based on her play in her first few months in the league, interest wise, it was a no brainer to put her on. Yeah. I mean, flipping it back over to the men's briefly to close things out here, but do we think that, or, you know, even on the women's side, right? Do we think that this commentary, what you're hearing in the media surrounding all this, like, does that seep in to these next couple of weeks in Paris? Obviously you have guys who are, you know, maybe don't know each other super well, or they're playing together for some of the first times or some of the only times in their career. Does this stuff have the chance to permeate a little bit more than it would for like a true close knit group of NBA players who are on a continuous team together? I personally think that because of the people who are leading the team, because it's LeBron James, because it's Steph Curry, this team is going to always say, hey, let's keep the main thing, the main thing. And even in the, the women's side. Asia Wilson is such a strong leader and that's that's all that they've been talking about. Now, I think that because their goal is to win Olympic gold, I don't think it's going to seep, personally don't think it's going to seep in there, but it's the after that I'm that I'm really concerned about or that I'm thinking will uh, have an effect. If if you have your, your managing director of USA Men's Basketball, you know, basically saying the word conspiracy theory, like, I think there's going to be a little bit of ruffled feathers, even because just because of the term. I think it's a term, right? Um, so it, it, I think there are going to be more players that are going to be like Jalen Brown and Kyrie Irving. And maybe, you know, whoever comes down the line, that, that will be a little bit more difficult, especially because I think 2028 is probably going to be the first year where Team USA is going to be a little compromised, at least from the men's side. My quick answer, John, on, you know, does the media affect things not to give us too much power? Absolutely. I mean, any of these guys, any of these guys who say they're not reading the headlines, they're seeing it. And then especially even more than any other sport, the NBA and recently the WNBA, I used to call the NBA the social media league. I mean, these guys are mixing it up, responding to people publicly. Yes, they're seeing it. Yes, everything that comes out affects everything. I mean, you know, just last week, uh, our reporter, Margaret Fleming, interviewed Nadia Rawlinson, who's a a co-owner of the Chicago Sky. And I noticed in the interview that Nadia said, Um, To those who said something about why we're spending so much now on our new practice facility, I don't usually respond to social media comments. I try not to read social media. And I thought, you know, respectfully, if you even have to say it and if you're taking the the moment to respond to it, you you read it, you see it, everyone sees it, whether it's execs, players, coaches. Oh, yeah. What gets said in the media uh, affects the the interplay and the locker room camaraderie, all of it. Totally. Yeah, it's a very interconnected situation in the locker room with the media. We'll keep an eye on things going forward. But Colin Salau, Dan Roberts, thank you so much for joining today.